call the meeting to order. We'd like to uh, ask the town attorney to report on that. Thank you. The town council met in closed session with respect to all of the items that are on the closed session agenda, and there is no reportable action on any of the items, and that concludes the report. Thank you. And with that, we will call the December 6, 2022 meeting of the Yucca Valley Town Council to order. May we have a roll call, please? Council members Abel. Here. Droz. Here. Dennison. Lombardo. Here. And Mayor Schooler. Here. If you all stand and join us in the uh, pledge to the flag led by Council Member Lombardo. Please face the flag, put your hand over your heart, repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Our first order of business is the introduction of new employees. Who's going to handle that? Yes, Mayor Schooler. Um, I'd like to introduce our museum supervisor, Stephanie Ritter, to introduce our new employee. So, yes. Um, Council, Mayor, um, I'm very excited to introduce um, Celeste. Uh, She's the newest member of our museum family. Uh, Celeste is a super enthusiastic educator. <laughs> and as a new museum programs coordinator, uh, she's prepared to further and expand the museum's educational mission. She already has some really great plans. Um, as a long-time member of our community, Celeste is super passionate about the desert, about the people living here. And we are certain that she's going to be a great asset for the High Desert Nature Museum as well as the town of Yaka Valley at large. You want to say anything, Celeste? No. Okay. <laughs> no, you're good so with we that? Are, yeah, we're very happy to have one more member to our museum team. So we're excited. Okay, very good. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. And with that, may we uh, get a motion to approve the agenda this evening? Mayor, I'll make the motion to approve tonight's agenda. All second. Council members Abel? Yes. Droz? Yes. Lombardo? Yes. And Mayor Schooler? Yes. Consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are routine matters or formal documents covering previous town council instruction. Items are enacted by one motion and a second without separate discussion unless a member of the town council or town staff requests dialogue on a specific item at the beginning of the meeting. Requests for public comment on the consent agenda items should be filed with the town clerk. Is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on any item on the consent agenda? Seeing none, any member of the council? I have a question to our lawyer. Uh, I was uh, absent from the October 4th meeting do I have to uh, abstain from? Yeah, you can so just abstain. Can I not vote on consent agenda? Or, or I'm sorry, how does that work? Do I have to single it out? It, yeah, if you just, uh, uh, just just state for the record that you're abstaining from that item. That item, okay. And then there's three more votes that, that could approve that item. Okay, I'm abstaining from item four. I was absent. Okay, with that, any other comments on the consent agenda? No, I'd like to uh, make a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda items one through 15. And I will second. second that. We have a second. Can we get a vote, please? Council members Abel? Yes. Droz? Yes. Lombardo? Yes. And Mayor Schooler? Yes. Item number 16, acceptance of a donation in memory of Barry Allen Absec. Can we have a staff report on that, please? Yes, Mayor Schooler and council members. Uh, this item is the acceptance of a donation in memory of Barry Absec. Uh, the recommendation is that the council accept the donation from Ms. Kristen Mary of $7,500 to provide funding for the youth basketball program in memory of Barry Allen Absec. In November of, no, in November of 2022, the town was approached by Ms. Mary to offer donation funds collected in memory of Barry Allen Absec for the funding of the town's youth basketball program. Uh, the families here, um, they don't wish to speak, but I'd like to read the letter that was enclosed with their donation. 
Please accept this donation for the Town of Yucca Valley Youth Basketball Program in loving memory of Barry Allen Absec. Barry was a sports enthusiast. He especially loved Boise State football, his alma mater, the Yankees, and all things basketball. He was a formal physical education teacher at Onaga Elementary School for 10 years and coached basketball for the Town of Yucca Valley, Yucca Valley High School, Joshua Springs Christian School, and Palmdale Learning Plaza, as well as other organizations. Barry was previously honored by the Boys and Girls Club of the High Desert as Volunteer of the Year in recognition of his contributions to coaching and youth sports. On January 19th, 2022, Barry died tragically in a car accident in the early morning as he traveled from his home in Chino to Palmdale. He was on his way to coach morning practice for the junior high boys basketball team at Palmdale Learning Plaza. Barry was a gentle giant. He had a kind soul and a big heart. He is greatly missed by his family and friends. Barry is remembered as a loving and faithful husband, son, brother, uncle, brother-in-law, nephew, coach, teacher, and friend. Enclosed as a check for $7,500, this money was collected in memory of Barry by his family and friends. A large portion of the donation <clears throat> was collected by his family and friends from Kellogg, Idaho. The donation is intended solely for the youth basketball program, Town of Yucca Valley. Thank you for the opportunity for Barry's family and friends to continue to support his life's work, positively impacting youth through sports. Uh, town staff also has very fond memories of working with Barry. As a matter of fact, he coached during the period of time that I was in charge of the basketball program. And um, he, it was so great to see him coach. You know, he, he coached wherever we had a need, which was super. And to see him coach, he, he had a particular affinity for the sixth and seventh graders. And he's, as you can see, he's a basketball player. Um, and to see him coach these little kids was just a wonder. They just followed him and loved him and just had a great time uh, when he was coaching. So we definitely appreciate him. He was such a skilled coach and was willing to serve wherever the kids needed him. Um, so we're so happy to accept this donation uh, to fund um, our youth basketball program um, our recommendation is that the town council accept the donation. Uh, the funds will be tracked and expended from the recreation department budget uh, with a specific designation of the funds for the Barry Absec Youth Scholarship Fund for participants with need in the town's youth basketball program. And so we definitely encourage the town council to accept and recognize this generous de donation and offer our sincerest condolences to Barry's family. Um, so thank you so much to Miss Mary and all of Barry's family. Thank you, Sue. Is there any member of the public that wishes to add a comment to this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council. Uh, I know how difficult it is to find good coaches sometimes in our basketball programs, uh, especially over the years. Uh, and some coaches just stand out. And um, it sounds like uh, Barry was one of those. I think this gesture in his memory is just uh, very uh, welcome and appropriate. And uh, uh, I like that it's going to scholarships for, for kids that need that. So any other council members have any comments? Just want to say what a fitting a memorial it seems to be for uh, Barry to uh, provide this ongoing uh, scholarship fund for kids that really uh, need it, kids in need, and uh, it will help them enjoy a sport that Barry really loved. And it's just really emotional to see the the support from the community and uh, the thoughtfulness of the family. We thank you. Council Member Droz. Um, how long was Barry a uh, member of, um, you know, like a, you know, how long did he live in Yucca Valley and how long was he with the basketball? Any, anybody know? Well, he was a physical education teacher at Onaga for a decade. Wow. Um, I remember him from um, when I managed the um, youth basketball program was, a, um, you know, 12, 13, 14, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. uh, period of time. but. He, he was just, uh, of course, a, a, a natural with the kids and um, just so supportive and 
uh, you know, would go, would coach any division that we needed. Anywhere the kids needed him was where he wanted to be, so. What an incredible history. I'm wondering if, uh, this may be getting off track, but maybe with our new Prop 68 center up there and the basketball courts, we should have like a memorial for people that have passed away and, and gave their time to the town and put a plaque on the wall and, um, because the people have lost their lives and contributed to the town, I think that would be important. But anyway, um, I think it's incredible what Barry has done, and um, I'm sorry for the family, and thank you for the donation. Also, I, I also um, echo that uh, as far as uh, the, uh, the, the family members and the friends that donated on his behalf. I'm sure he's very, very pleased to see uh, that come together, because obviously through his serving the community in a, a number of different ways. As I'm reading here, he's given back to young people all his life there and, and for, for a, a con contribution or donation to be made in his name for youth is just very appropriate. Um, I hope other people take that um, spirit and, and do the same. Uh, it's inspired me to think about that for myself when that time comes that I should have something set up in advance uh, to go towards causes I believe in. And obviously he gave to, to children and to those families for a number of years. So I appreciate that. It doesn't go without uh, recognition that his team was called the Broncos. That's no, uh, no surprise there since he's a Boise State guy. Uh, but again, thank you so much to the family and uh, the money will go to the youth and it will be a great memorial. And thank you for donating it to our, our youth program. Uh, Aaron? Yes, thank you again. Is there uh, a motion to accept this donation? Yes, I'll move to, we accept the donation on Barry's behalf. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Council members Abel? Yes. Droz? Yes. Lombardo? Yes. And Mayor Schooler? Yes. Again, thank you and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Okay, item number 17, a public hearing. Um, Public Facility Development Impact Fee Public Hearing. I um, mean, we have a staff report, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The recommended action before you this evening is that the Council retains the current Public Facility Development Impact Fee structure and direct staff to include funding in the 2023-2024 budget review for an update to the Public Facility Development Impact Fee Study. Uh, impact fees um, are charged to new development to offset the cost of infrastructure, which is required to be built uh, and, and built because of uh, the creation of impacts caused by new development. The town has five categories of impact fees. Those include general facilities, park facilities, trails, storm drains, and streets and traffic. In 2011, the town council uh, readjusted the structure and the fees charged in those different categories. And there have been no changes to the fees between 2013 uh, and 2021, the most recent council review. In summary, those fees are established as $9,081 for a single family home in a new subdivision, $2,568 per new home for infill development. So infill is building a new home on an existing lot of record. Multifamily residential is set at $3,600 per unit. And the town council created, uh, back in 2011, created an incentive program for commercial general office and industrial development lowering the costs for smaller projects. So up to 3,000 square feet was $1 per square foot. Between 3,001 and 5,000 square feet, $2 per square foot. Between 5,001 and 10,000 square feet, $4 per square foot. And then 10,001 square feet or more set at $7.85 per square feet. Included in your packet this evening, the council will see the uh, beginning balance or the imbalance of 2021 and compare against the imbalance of 2022. Going down the categories, fund balance at the end of the uh, prior fiscal year, <clears throat> general facilities 
at $29,269, parks at $588,780, streets and traffic at $652,862, drainage at $994,660, and finally trails at $58,723. The council has the opportunity every year with the budget process and the capital projects budget process to allocate those dollars to specific projects and the council does that annually with your budget review process. Uh, again, the recommendation is that the council retains the current fee structure and directs staff to include funding in the next budget cycle for an update to the public facility development impact fee study report concludes the staff presentation and we would be happy to answer questions following the public hearing. Thank you. With that, I will open the public hearing. Does any member of the public wish to comment on this item? Anyone online? No one online? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to council for comment and or motion. The impact fees have been maintained the same since 2013. It's, I think it's time we look at that again. And uh, I approve, I, I in favor of keeping it the same at this time, but um, allocating money in the future to study the need to increase or decrease that fee. Okay, any other comments or a motion? A question. So this will come up again next year, correct? So by ordinance, by ordinance established by the council, you hold an annual public hearing to consider changing the fee level charged for impact fees. So this is mandated by your ordinance, so this does come before the town council on an annual basis. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And, and I'd like to move the item forward if... You know, and next year we can review it again and decide. Is it usually in April that we do that, or is there a particular month that we've done it? In the we, past? we usually do it in the fall of every year. Fall, okay. Shane, as uh, monies are collected through impact fees, uh, they have to be used in a certain amount of time or they're refunded back to the developer? That's correct, and the town follows state law whereby the town makes findings on an annual basis. It's prescribed by law every five years, but the town makes those findings every year. And that was on your consent agenda this evening, so the town ensures compliance with the state law so that those funds are not, uh, there's no necessity for refunding those dollars. Okay, and then uh, can you give me an example of how possible trails money would be used? Uh, so recent example would be the North Park uh, construction project and the establishment of a trail connecting the newer segment of that to the existing facility. That would be uh, an appropriate uh, allocation of those funds. Establishing a trail from the community center down to Tri-Valley Little League, Bo Boys and Girls Club, the Brem Youth Sports Park, that complex would be an appropriate expenditure of those dollars. So those are just two examples. All right, wonderful. Yeah, I'll make a, uh, I'll, I'll uh, second the motion to go ahead and accept this as, uh, as currently presented. So we have a motion by Council Member Droz and a second by Council Member Abel. Council Members Abel? Yes. Droz? Yes. Lombardo? Yes. And Mayor Schooler? Yes. Item number 18, San Bernardino County Transit Authority Council of Governments Housing Trust Update and Letter of Interest. Do you have a report on that, please? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, this is timely information. You'll remember at uh, one of your last council meetings as future agenda items, you were looking for some information on different op options and opportunities that the town might have to uh, further our efforts in affordable housing and meeting some of that need that's out there. This evening, you're gonna be asked to receive and file a verbal presentation on the current status and proposed creation of a new regional housing trust by San Bernardino County uh, Transportation Authority, Council of Governments, or the COG. So to introduce the item, discuss it a little bit, we've uh, asked Monique Reza Ariano to come from SBCTA. Uh, Monique's here with us this evening. And so Monique, I'm just gonna turn it over to you and let you run from here. That's good. Uh Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm happy to present this information and um, I am open to any kind of questions and all questions after the, or during, however you wanna do it. 
So I think the first question that everybody is probably asking is what is a housing trust? Essentially, it is a tool that we would implement in order to bring funding, outside funding sources to this region in an effort to promote, build, um, bring development of all types of housing. <clears throat> So the benefits that we've identified, we've done um, some analysis over the last year. Um, we've been working with our city managers TAC um, specifically to kind of create what this program is gonna look like. And um, along the way, we've done some research and analysis based on existing housing trusts throughout the uh, Southern California region, as well as just information that we were able to find as far as state and federal funds. So what we've identified as what our, the benefits would be for our trust is it would be a flexible source of gap financing for housing development. We would be able to compete for state funds that currently um, are really just left on the table because no housing trusts ex exist in San Bernardino County. It would be uh, targeted solutions for regional issues. So essentially, what are the issues that each of your jurisdictions are dealing with? And what is it that we, as a, a new JPA housing trust, how can we tackle those issues? Um, one of the examples that was brought up during our conversations with a lot of the jurisdictions is workforce housing. What's that middle? Um, you know, the, the work, workforce housing, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> um, and then ability to pull resources. So if we have multiple agencies that are pulling their resources to fund the cost of what the trust is, those dollars can be maximized and leveraged to bring in all of those additional federal and state dollars. <clears throat> We've identified a trust vision and goal, um, which is essentially the trust is gonna be established to bring all of those outside dollars to the region with the, the purpose of attracting affordable housing developers, increasing and preserving the region's housing supply, um, increase equitable access to community resources, um, and then provide financial relief for vulnerable and cost burdened households, and then protect against displacement um, and poor housing conditions throughout the region. <clears throat> so why do we need one? This is on a regional basis. This isn't specific to, um, to Yucca Valley. But essentially, we know across the region there is serious household overcrowding. More than 20% of households throughout our region experience overcrowding. Um, household overpayment, uh, the region really has census tracts where more than 80% of renters are burdened by the cost of housing. And what that means is essentially they're spending more than 30% of their inco income on housing. Uh, poverty, the region has census tracts with con concentrations of more than 40% of households living below the poverty level. And again, this is regional. <clears throat> um, and the cost of transportation combined with the cost of housing in some of these areas, uh, people are spending almost 60% of their income just to, to fund those. And then um, tax credit really goes to areas from the, st the state identifies tax credits for places that are considered higher resource areas and a trust would actually elevate this region status so uh, that developers would have more incentive to come here. And then of course we have arena <laughs> issues. So we're currently in the, actually we're in the sixth cycle now, but essentially there's an, in, a, an increase of 140% uh, that the state is gonna require that we as a region build throughout the county. So what have we done to date? <clears throat> well, we have, like I said, we have done a lot of analysis and we've done some outreach. We've kind of identified what the potential activities of the trust could be. We've done some gap analysis and all of that is encompassed in the strategic plan. And I, I believe that's a part of this um, agenda item. So all of this information is in your, in your agenda tonight. But I'm gonna go over some highlights real quick. So as I said, in the beginning of the year, we, we really started working with our city manager's technical advisory committee to do a lot of the scoping of what this housing trust is gonna be. Um, and a part of that was an outreach, a huge outreach effort that we did. We contacted all of our member agencies, so all 23 cities and the county, to get an understanding of what the issues are in their jurisdictions. And we interviewed all of a lot of outside organizations, Orange County Housing Finance Trust, um, the County of Orange, who also has a trust, San Gabriel Regional Valley Housing Trust, to kind of identify what the best practices are, um, lessons that they've learned that we can kind of take and um, utilize as we implement going forward. And then we've done several group presentations for our board, the City County Managers Te Technical Advisory Committee, and then the planning directors. 
<clears throat> our funding opportunity analysis really shows that these are these are going to be the main components for funding our trust um, grant funding pursuits those are probably going to be the the heavy lifters for the trust but we are hoping to implement a a revolving loan fund for local agencies and the interest gained over time would be you know able to be reallocated um, we are hoping to gain a nonprofit partner um, if we are able to gain a nonprofit partner we can go after private donations which would give us a little bit more discretion on how those dollars are used obviously grant funds are prescriptive and you know there's certain eligibility requirements but if we're able to gain private donations we would be able to have a little bit more discretion on how those are used um, we are looking at implementing a VMT mitigation bank and um, revenues from that, a portion of those uh, could be allocated towards the housing trust. And then we are going to make a concerted effort to gain earmark funds for the trust. Almost every other um, housing trust that's been established has been able to gain significant earmark dollars from their representatives. So we're really hoping that that's going to be a good fund. Um, so we did a housing inventory, an affordable housing inventory. I know it's hard to see, but the blue dots are the existing affordable housing, and this is over the last five years. And then we have pipeline affordable housing developments that we know have been approved, and these are funded, and those are the little orange ones. I believe there's only five of them. <clears throat> and uh, with those uh, projects that we looked at, we did a funding gap analysis and really identified where the housing trust would actually play a part. So essentially, um, we're looking at $160,000 per unit is the cost of any, um, I should say, the average cost of any one unit for those um, affordable housing projects that were identified in the previous slide. So what we've, what we've uh, determined is that these affordable housing developments have several sources of funds they find dozens of fund sources and the average across all of them is about 10 percent of those costs that they have to finance so we are looking at helping them get over the <laughs> over the finish line and reduce that amount that needs to be financed we wouldn't cover the entire cost but we would help them um, get a little bit better financing <clears throat> So the structure for the trust that we've identified, um, we know what the vision is and the goals. Um, I kind of went over that already. But based on the conversations that we've had and the direction that we received from the city manager's te technical advisory committee, these are the priorities that they would like to see funded through the trust. Um, new construction for affordable housing, affordable housing preservation and rehab, land trusts, workforce housing, down payment assistance, and financing for the purchase of land. So these are the main priority areas that they would like to see funded through the trust. Administration of the trust would require the implementation of a new JPA, um, and that JPA would have a board of directors, which would be um, similar to how the, the COG or SBCTA is, is currently established. Essentially one director per jurisdiction, and um, we the city manager are very interested in incentivizing the jurisdictions that join early as founding members. Um, and then there's a two year term limit with no limit to the number of terms for the board. <coughs> um, the administration behind the scenes would require staffing, um, treasurer, attorney, account, accounting. And all of these would be, these costs would be covered by the member agencies that would be participating in the trust. So the cost of the trust we've identified to be about $315,000 for an annual operating budget and this cost would be allocated across the member agencies that would be interested in joining um, and it would be allocated by population so uh, for agencies up to 25,000 they would be paying $10,000 and then for $100,000 plus it's 30 that's the cap. So visualizing how it works, essentially we're in this, this first segment where we're kind of identifying who the member agencies are going to be. Um, and we are working through our SBCOG board to, to get that done. And then once the JPA is established, we would fund the trust. So then we would go out and, and find all of these state, federal dollars, donations, and, and other fund sources that we can. And then spread it across the region. So rural communities, suburban, urbanized, um, Again, we're looking at allocating based on the need of the agencies, which you guys identify as, as needed. 
Um, and then we haven't gotten into the weeds yet, but there is definitely questions of equity that have come up in our conversations. So I want to ensure that that is one of the top priorities, like ensuring allocation equitably across the region. Are you guys gonna com be competing with a Rancho Cucamonga or are you gonna be competing more with a uh, Ukaipa? So how does that look? We, we still don't know yet, but those are all conversations that will be determined by the JPA that would be established. So the next steps, um, currently we're identifying participating jurisdictions, and that would be the letter that Curtis referred to. We're essentially going to be um, applying for funding through SCAG in uh, the REAP 2.0 program, and we're hoping to have about $30 million to start uh, with that pot. <clears throat> and so once we are able to get that funding through that application, we would establish that JPA and then the administrative plan would be how all of those funds would be received and allocated to the jurisdictions that are participating. So the schedule currently, um, actually this needed to be updated and I apologize, but the um, December we, oh, nope, it has been updated. December we are going to Mountain Desert and uh, Metro Valley Study Session, which is next week. And then we are going to our board uh, for our final approval in January. And then we will be submitting the application to SCAG in January as well. And then once we receive funding, we're looking probably about March, April timeframe, um, we would be working quickly to establish that new JPA. And that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Monique, thank you so much. Just a couple of uh, follow-up comments, Council. So first of all, on packet page 421 is the letter of interest if the Council is in, interested in supporting this this evening. Uh, staff recommendation, obviously, would be uh, to request that letter of support. It's non-binding at this point. Uh, there would be formation documentation that needs to come back to the Council for formal approval and entry into the trust. As the council has discussed and talked about uh, as recently as your last couple of meetings, the need is great here in our basin for affordable housing, some of the different programs that might be available. Um, as Monique's indicated, the, uh, there's a lot of details that need to be flushed out. How does the town specifically, how does the Morongo Basin specifically benefit from the trust? I think uh, in one of the slides that was presented tonight, there was a kind of a menu of different types of support functions that might be able to be provided through the trust. And it may be that the town or other rural areas are accessing certain portions of those, the more urbanized areas, other components of those. So uh, at this point, we feel very comfortable that this is the right direction. Um, and the trust would uh, allow the town to maybe have access to types of funds that we wouldn't otherwise have, or that would be very cumbersome for us to put together as a small agency and try and administer ourselves. So. Uh, again, Monique, thank you so much. We'd uh, open it up for council comments uh, after public comment. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for the presentation. Is there any member of the public here tonight that would like to uh, ask a question or comment on this item? Anyone online? No? Bring it back to the council for questions, comments. Yeah, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Obviously, we do want to move forward with uh, some type of affordable housing uh, uh, strategy uh, and so forth you know um, I'm I mean down payment assistance and gap financing and and, uh, and those types of things you know I I really want to I want to have a goal in mind of what we're trying to accomplish you know are we trying to put more units available like we did the senior housing project where it's it's physical units for people to be able to afford and live in or is it something that you can't see but is supporting like down payment assistance and so forth? And does that really accomplish what we really need to do? And of course, like the, the old million dollar question is equity in, in getting the funds that you need because we're a small community and bigger communities have a bigger voice and yet we have some of the most uh, needs uh, that I can think of in, in this particular area with workforce housing, you know, that's starting to be an issue. You can have two income jobs and now it's really hard to make ends meet in, in uh, being able to purchase a home or, or live in a home. So uh, can you answer or address some of those issues or concerns? I can't say anything definitively. What I can yeah. tell you is that all of the programs that were identified on that slide are currently on the table. So how we find allocations of dollars, as I said, the grant funds are probably gonna be 
the, uh, the workhorse for our trust. And those are very prescriptive and likely would go more towards affordable housing developments. However, through the SCAG dollars that we would be applying for, we are really looking to be a little bit more diverse with how those funds are spent. And as these programs are identified as priorities among the region, um, how we can find dollars that match what your priorities are, that's a huge interest for us. We, we wanna make sure that this makes sense for you guys. And it says you have 48 affordable housing trusts right now in California. This one is one that's being developed for San Bernardino County. That's correct. Um, again, being San Bernardino County so huge, is there been any thought or, or talk about building trusts that are a little bit more isolated and centralized? Three trusts within San Bernardino County versus one huge trust. There has not, and the the reason that pops into my brain about why there has not been is just simply the cost. It, regardless of whether it's a regional structure such as the one we're proposing or a smaller structure, your cost is likely gonna be $315,000 to start. And that's not gonna change depending on how many you have across. It's, it's just right. going to be Right, the administrative costs are gonna be the same whether it's large or small and you're losing money by having too many small exactly. units. Yeah, and then you're competing against each other. You know? yeah. True, true. And then uh, as far as the, um, uh, the the trust fund and so forth, um, regional housing, the uh, the annual fee, um, is that just a minimal cost? Because it, it seems like, you know, we're a small community, $10,000 annually, and then you can have a huge, super huge community. It's only 30,000, it's only, you know, a little more than, than it didn't seem like it was in proportion with the population. It is a proposed cost. Uh, obviously there can be um, discussions further at the JPA level once that JPA is established. Um, if, if there is a interest in increasing the fee for larger cities, I mean, that conversation certainly can take place. Yeah, or having, you know, so many dollars per 10,000 residents, and then that way, you know, anyway, those are, those are minor things when it comes to the overall scope of things. I'm just wondering how those numbers came about uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, what I do like about it is that, you know, that they do have the option to opt out if the program is really not working. If we uh, find that we're not really receiving the, what we're trying to do, uh, we can always opt out of it. Uh, but I would hate to miss the opportunity to be an initial partner with this. Yeah. What, I can, what I can tell you is that it is very much uh, not just a talking point, but very, it, we are committed to ensuring that you at least get your return on your investment. So whatever it is that you're putting in, we are really hoping to make sure that you get back what you're, what you're at least putting in on a regular basis. Obviously the, the long-term higher dollars are gonna be for you know, yeah. your affordable housing projects as they come along. It's really gonna be led by the projects and how ready they are to move forward. But it, seriously, if we're gonna <laughs> capture federal dollars, we need to be in this kind of a regional approach. It definitely doesn't hurt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm excited about seeing this program come about and um, I think we definitely ought to participate in it. Um, there's a lot to be gained by joining forces and um, can, can you help me understand a little bit about um, the grant money is just a one-time shot. How do we sustain this thing? So, How do we keep this going? Well, obviously always the priorities of the state are really gonna dictate <laughs> what monies are available. Right now, housing is a huge priority, so they're making a lot of money available. Right. The program that we are looking at specifically is, um, I believe it's called the State Housing Trust Fund. And what they do is match one-to-one -one up to $5 million on an annual basis. And so that we are looking at as being our main fund source on an annual basis. But again, that is going to be driven by what projects are available. So wherever those projects are across the region, and if they're ready to go, those are, that's how those dollars are going to be brought in. And that's matched with money in the trust already? It's matched with it the It matches project. the state's money? So the state would match the the project fund. So uh, a housing developer would come forth and they would have all of these other fund sources and they've identified and they're ready to go. And so we would say, okay, state, they've put all of this together. Let's get um, some kind of dollar allocation for this project. Oh, I see. And that's just available for the trust once it's established. Okay, and then 
the trust would help us find these funds though yes we we would be hiring a staff member actually it'd be a firm to administer the fund and they would be the ones going out and finding all of these and that's these one of the big advantages is you have somebody that's dedicated to exactly. grant writing and yeah. that sort of thing which is a real specific task that takes certain skills and uh and that's we'll really definitely benefit from that when we join a, a group that's bigger right and that's the main cost that's covered within that three hundred and fifteen thousand. and then it's a matter of attracting the builder the developer to our community which means we've got to be open to that idea and where to put it uh, a lot of this is going to be in conjunction with transportation like near a bus line and that sort of thing the idea is to combine those two things together transportation and the housing it probably doesn't hurt but we are not we're not going to be implementing those types of restrictions it would be possibly prescriptive depending on the grant source that we would find but as far as the trust we wouldn't be okay. we wouldn't be doing that all right very good i'm excited and i think we ought to participate yeah, this is a, a very interesting option and uh, we obviously love the idea of having a, a partner uh, as we approach our housing problem uh, and issues uh, did you say that shelf ready projects uh, are likely to be um, um, favored in funding they would be dry the the project readiness would be driving the the fund availability for the trust yeah okay all right well right is um is there funding available to develop those those projects or yeah and actually that's one of the ways that we're looking at making sure that there's a return on your investment not just building projects but helping the local agencies get ready so does that include visioning does that include planning what is it that is the need of your agencies to get those projects ready to go okay very very interesting uh, thank you for the report uh, i think this is a really good option uh, down the road. So do we need a motion on this or is this a receive and file? Uh, it's receive and file, but I would like a motion from the council if you're interested in uh, submitting the letter that was in your agenda packet. It's again, it's non-binding. It's just indicating to SBCTA COG that the town of Yuck Valley is interested in the, uh, uh, as a likely member in the housing trust. And then uh, additional steps would be required for full implementation at a later date. Okay. Can I get a motion to that effect to I'll approve the letter? To that. Yeah. A motion, council member Lombardo. I will second that. Council Member Zabel? Yes. Droz? Yes. Lombardo? Yes. And Mayor Schooler? Yes. Monique, thank you. thank you so much for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good night. Item number 19, Yucca Valley Senior Center update. We're going to have a staff report, please. Yes, Mayor Schooler and Council Members. Um, we wanted to come back. You haven't seen us present on the senior center since 2019 pre-covid oh so we wanted to come back and and uh first of all do a little bit of background kind of reminder where we came from back in 2018 um if you recall the seniors were in here they were talking about wanting more services and the town council responded with allocations from uh, measure y to expand our programming at the senior center. And uh, the, we established um, a position there, a part-time unbenefited position there at the senior center and a budget from Measure Y. Uh, in the spring of 18, we hired Nina McCullough uh, to lead our town senior center programming. Uh, I remember when we interviewed Nina in 2018, uh, we, Deborah and I walked out and said, we have a ringer. We, uh, she know. has worked for, been a representative and a gov government liaison for Edison. She was on uh, senior advocacy boards in the low desert. Uh, we were just walking on air when we got out of that <laughs> panel. Um, and she didn't disappoint. She st hit the ground running. Uh, by 2019, um, she had won uh, the best of the best uh, for senior centers uh, from High Desert Publishing. Um, and it went from just serving lunch over there to just pop in and all of her holiday events and everything were just gangbusters and everyone was so excited. Uh, so, you know, then of course we, we added a staff member, another part-time staff member to, to kind of help her out. She was uh, really doing everything on her own. And, uh, you know, 2020, we added another staff member 
wham, door gets slammed. You know, we, she had been really uh, performing so well and everyone was so excited and then we got shuttered for 17 months. So um, interestingly enough, uh, even, you know, they, our staff did a great job of pivoting. Uh, they helped out with the logistics for the FSO, FSA drive-through food distribution. You know, you're talking 1,100 meals a week. Um, she also started the Golden Reference newsletter that was distributed with the meals that we did, you know, invitations to get weekly calls. The Youth Commission did pen pals and holiday cards. So, you know, not only did she keep the programming running, but in the meantime, she's remodeling the lobby and buying local art and <laughs> it was just incredible and ended up, you know, close to the public getting third place in the best of the best. So that was pretty impressive as well. We continued to be closed, um, you know, 2021 for most of the year. Uh, COVID was still an impact. Uh, she, con she continued with, uh, you know, all of her efforts um, as far as the virtual and remote uh, programming, reaching out to um, our participants uh, and all of that. We did finally reopen on September 1st uh, and she had a full slate of programs ready. I put in the September uh, calendar in your packet so you could see, you know, that's reopening from COVID. Full slate of programs, uh, you know, locked the load, ready to go and, uh, and kicked it off. Uh, she also um, instituted a senior center membership, which is a standard in the business. Um, seniors who attend a senior center, it's very common for senior centers to have a membership. Ours is free. Um, but, you know, we have had medical issues and things like that that come up with seniors. So um, the advantage is we have their emergency contact, uh, you know, right, readily available uh, should something occur. It also gives us a chance to communicate with our seniors. They love to get mail. Uh, they don't do email all that often. You know, some of our uh, older senior set, they love getting uh, a monthly mailer from us and it gave us that opportunity as well. Um, so that was instituted when we came back from COVID. Uh, we added, um, we had lost our, our part-timer on the onset of, of COVID. So we, now that we'd reopened, we hired Zahara Sharf to come in and backfill that second position. Uh, and Zahara's done a great job and is, is doing an amazing job over there at the Senior Center. She spearheads our membership program. Uh, so then you see, you know, they're only open from September to the end of the year and they get second place and best of the best. So, you know, they're already, you know, really rolling. Here we are, 2022. Um, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, we get CDBG funds to remodel the kitchen, uh, which is great. You know, they, uh, the kitchen is, now so much more capable and can handle uh, the increase in meals that has occurred over this period because the senior center is getting more and more popular. So not only could they better deal with an incident like COVID or something like that, um, but they're also now able to order enough food to keep up with the increase in attendance. You know, uh, back in 2018, we probably had an average of about 40 uh, seniors for lunch. Now we average around 75 uh, for lunch if it's a special event, like on the calendar, you see holiday events or the birthday day of the month, you know, we're breaking 100 uh, over there. So it's packed, it's, it gets packed, especially on the special, um, the special events. Um, through that time, you saw uh, Nina, and I'll, I'll have the girls come up in a minute and, and show you some pictures and talk about the particular items that are important to them. But, you know, what I notice about what they've done over the last couple of years is, is really, figuring out where the, need, where the needs are um, and uh, Nina's capability of partnering with Desert Oasis Healthcare, getting donation money. I mean, she's on a shoestring budget, but she's still putting out, you know, starting balance classes and senior Pilates and, you know, these, these classes that, you know, we're still not charging for. You know, the seniors with their membership, they get in free. And so you see, you know, these chair yoga classes and all of that where she's offering, you know, uh, professional level senior programming, you know, for, <laughs> for pennies, you know, so, um, but we're, we're really excited. Um, she's back in first place, 2022, first place, best of the best of senior centers, uh, you know, uh, so 
super impressive. Uh, she's added mobile pantries. Um, you know, with the with the impact of inflation on our seniors, she wants to make sure that they don't have food insecurity and that they have the resources they need to to maintain and and uh, and the addition of the caseworker is a, another need that um, they discovered. Um, both of us have aging mothers, and it was really important to us to make sure that we had a staff in the senior center that can help with Medi-Cal applications, that can help access some of these resources because many of our seniors up here don't have family who live nearby that can help them fill out these forms. Many of them you know, really struggle to apply, make online applications and things like that. Uh, so that's um, really important as well. And we felt that, that was a service that we wanted to provide. So we do have the caseworker that comes in. They can make an appointment if they wanna you know, apply for these benefits, then we can help them do so. Um, and then I'll, uh, what I wanna do is, so super excited. I know many of you have been to the senior center, so we're excited about that too. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, so what I'd like to do is invite Nina and Zahara up and have them talk a little bit. We can go through the slides and have particularly talk about the, I know Nina has um, really a focus on some of these uh, programs. So welcome Nina. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you very much. Um, I think you've covered most of the information. Of, uh, I want to say congratulations to Zara because she's been with us a year as of today. So uh, Zara is my coworker over there. Thank you. As Sue said, we were excited to be able to get um, upside down image. first place, second place, and third place. I know where the it says senior center, but they actually do the categories in senior facilities. So we're in the categories with other um, housing developments and things for that accommodate seniors. So that was uh, rewarding that we could still be in the eye of the public even during the time that we're closed in 2020 and 2021. 2019 is kind of, even though we started this position in 2018, 2019 kind of kicked off getting out into the community and figuring out what organizations out there that could, I could bring aboard to partner with us. And like Desert Oasis Healthcare, they were the first ones to jump in and offer their help and working with the Healthy Generations, MBTA, different organizations out there that in our community that I felt we needed to bring resources and education to the seniors uh, that visit our facilities so that we can make it easier for them. And then we also started in 19, taking a look of how we were going to do a little update on the thrift store and look at how we were gonna get the old couch out of the lobby and make <laughs> it look a little bit more like a, a modern day thrift store. I mean, a modern thrift store and a modern uh, lobby area appealing. 2020, 2020 was, we were just getting ready or just celebrated our big Think Patty's Day party and moving on in March and then we had to close. But uh, during the closure, we were able to still provide meals for uh, the public through with FSA, partnering with FSA and assisting them in distributing the food uh, via frozen meals. We also provided uh, newsletters. At the time, we didn't have a membership base, so how we were being able to communicate with the seniors during that time was actually working with S FSA and partnering with them to get our newsletters out there and trying to get information to the senior community. Of course, we still we had Facebook, but we're still learning that some of our senior community is not into Facebook and, and the social media world. So we had to find other resources to get them information. Youth commissioners were also helping us. Uh, we also did uh, programs for homebound during that time. We provide holiday packets and we got donations throughout the community to help with that. 2021 was we was still the same thing. During 2021, we were able to kind of go in and, and start some of our renovating in the lobby area, our offices, 
so that we could provide a fresh, clean look for the seniors when they came back so they would be able to notice something different about the facility when they came in. And then we also started, our, as Stu said, our membership program. And having that senior center membership is important. A lot of your senior centers charge anywhere from $25 to $35 a yearly fee, and we're providing this service for them. Uh, at no charge, but for us it gives us the opportunity to, to reach them if we need to by mail, to have emergency contact information, um, you know, to actually know when their birthdays are, all these extra little things that we could make it a little bit more special or individualized uh, as time goes on through the membership and having that information. I think, uh, yeah, 2022, 2022 we really, uh, before we closed in February, we were just getting started in, in, in cha vamping up some new programs and bringing on some new uh, resources into the, the senior center, and then we were closed for the renovation of, of the kitchen. But during that time, it was a good opportunity for me to look into figuring out what we were going to what we were going to bring aboard. Looking for new resources, we have new classes now. We did. Um, Sorry, we did a uh, toll out in, in the community and in the senior center. What are you looking for? What do you want from your senior center? Because when you think of seniors, you, you think, well, okay, you and I, we're seniors, and then there's a different age group of seniors. There's different categories of seniors. So what, what, are, what do they want? What do they want to see from us? What do they need from us? And that's what I'm looking for as far as what we're going to bring aboard. So a lot of them wanted the balance classes. Desert Oasis provided balance classes for us back in 2019 and 2020. But after COVID, they no longer had instructors anymore. But they had told me, look, we will support that class for you if you can find instructors. So we did. We've got that back on board again. We're also providing new exercise classes. And of course, we can't forget the dancing. The dancing is the most important part because the seniors love to dance. So we have our line dance classes. We have our dance exercise classes. Um, and we also have you know, tech time. From time to time, we have different, um, our partner with uh, California State comes in and provides me with the resources for education as well as sometimes working uh, with the youth we're working out something with Boys and Girls Club as well, where they will be able to come in and also help us with the tech time. It'll be a later afternoon program, so that's something more in the, in the future area. And what, what are we looking for for 2023? To continue our research to find out what's needed in the community, what um, maybe even later on, I, we might even look at having one later day maybe we're open from four to seven once a week so that we can provide resources for you know seniors that are working all day people that within our my age group that want to go to a yoga class or want to go to an educational class or maybe they need a seminar maybe they need to get information but they work all day so that might be something we're looking for in the community so we can broaden what we bring into the community as far as when we say senior what what are we accommodating? Are we accommodating all various of that age group? That's our December calendar. It's kind of a busy calendar, even though we are going to be closed part of uh, the end of the month. We've got uh, a big party coming up this Saturday night. We have uh, the senior dance, which we haven't had in a while. And we have a, the wrecking crew, which all the seniors love the wrecking crew. We have that coming up this Saturday night, and then our holiday party will be on the 14th. So I'm planning for a packed house. Thanksgiving we had 138, so I'm sure we're going to have that many uh, for Christmas as well. And let's see, those are just some snapshots of our Halloween party. Halloween party we did have over 100, and usually we, for this particular one, we had a musician come out and entertain the seniors and it was interactive they were able to participate and and get involved in it that's just a picture there i believe of our uh, line dancing classes mm -hmm. and maybe a craft classes that was a, a grand opening when we reopened back again with the remodel of the kitchen and we were able to get community support from various different entities that that came out and helped uh, support us during that reopening 
do provide a monthly calendar and um, the calendar seems to be very popular because I can put a hundred copies out one day and the next day I go out in the lobby and it's empty. So I'm not sure what they do with all these calendars, but they go faster than I can actually print them up. They do have the menu on the back. So I think maybe a lot of times people come in and say, hey, what's for lunch? Grab a new calendar and uh, repeats itself the next day. But uh, the calendars seem to be very, very popular at this time. That would be it. If anybody has any questions about what, what we're doing at the Senior Center or what you'd like to see me better or any ideas, I'm very open to that. Well, thank you, Nina. That's, uh, that's an awesome presentation. Uh, I, I can remember the before Nina days at the Senior Center where um, uh, it was well attended for lunch, I guess, but it seemed to be kind of a closed club and a lot of people didn't feel welcome there. But I think you've changed that completely and, and made that uh, a very welcoming, uh, active center that was only a vision uh, back uh, before in the old days. It was uh, uh, just something that we thought, well, maybe there's that potential, but I think you've fulfilled the potential and more. And I do see those calendars a lot of places, you know, as, as I go around, and I know people do pay attention to that, and it's, it's just awesome to me that, to see uh, what you've been able to do there. Uh, and and I, I know that both of you, uh, Nina and Zahara, are, are uh, very excited about your job. It just shows. And uh, when I've been over there, when I've talked to people, and even out in mobile home parks when I talk to people, it's always positive reviews about what's happening at the Senior Center, so congratulations and thank you for this report. That's thank awesome. You. Is there any other member of the public first uh, that wanted to comment on this? Anybody online? Mayor, okay. I, I, I would just want to uh, highlight again, Sue and, and Nina both mentioned it tonight, but these, these programs would not be available without Measure Y funding. Mm -hmm. It's a absolutely essential, critical part of our funding model. Uh, it is used, uh, again, remember public safety infrastructure, and that third leg is quality of life. These are the quality of life programs. So even though we uh, at some point may look at, you know, what funding structure is sustainable, um, probably free subsidized is, is not in, in perpetuity, but um, it's being made available now through Measure Y. And we can thank the voters for Yucca Valley and their continuous support of that programming. That's a, a really good point. And, and it is... You mentioned quality of life. I think I think at the senior level, uh, quality of life is is huge. We have a lot of people that are alone and don't really have a lot of family nearby, or uh, this is their connection uh, and you know kind of a reason for living. Uh, you know, a lot of cases. And I remember in the old days when uh, seniors were. You know, the older seniors who were pretty territorial about the senior center <clears throat> and said, yes, we need, to, we need to get the younger seniors in, but then the younger seniors weren't feeling especially welcome coming in. So it was kind of a, a barrier that really needed to be bridged. Uh, but um, I, you've, you've been able to do that. But I think the, the, the fact that you've improved quality of life for so many people, and um, it, it's just, it just shows. So, so thank you for that. Any other council members? Uh, Councilmember Droz? I'll just say um, I'm thankful for Measure Y for making all this possible. And um, Nina and Zahara, um, I really appreciate what you do. And looking at the, the, um, the calendar is incredible. It's like really inviting. It's colorful. And looking at the uh, menu also looks yummy. So... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I haven't been there in a while. I, I was there like, uh, I guess last, I don't know. When last, we did our grand, grand opening. Yes, yes. That's the last time I was there. But anyway, I need to go back. But um, I appreciate all you do, and it's such an inviting place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you both for doing an excellent job. And I'm sure uh, the seniors that do come there, they just look forward to seeing both of you and you recognizing them. and and all the compliments that go back and forth, I'm sure is, uh, is, is, is great. I had a question for either one of you. How do most of the seniors arrive to the center? What's their mode of transportation? We have a various uh, means of how they arrive. Some of them arrive via friends, you know, people that bring them to the senior center. Some of them drive themselves. And we do have a ready ride, which has a lunch bus service. So the lunch bus is provided by FSA. They pay for the seniors to come on the lunch bus. 
And then there's also a ready ride bus where the senior themselves would call in and book a um, appointment to come in. And then, so like I said, some of them do drive. So a variety, and I saw that you have bus passes that are handed yes, out. Yes, bus passes. We work with the county and the social services office. So a matter of fact, they'll be there tomorrow. It's once a month, they come in and provide um, free bus passes. The there, there's the bus passes for regular bus passes and then ready ride. And then there's also the service. If you just want to come from lunch, then that is provided to us by uh, Yucca Valley Senior Club. All right, wonderful. And then you talked about the uh, physical activities. That's that's really great, um, and a lot of participation. How much, on average, you said dances seem to be the most actively participated in. Yeah, we, we would say 14 to 18, depending on the, the the particular day and the weather outside too. So probably 14 to 18 participate in our, um, especially line dances and Zumba dance classes. Uh, balance classes right now are running 12 to 15. Yeah, okay. Pilates is new, but it started off with uh, 12 people on the first uh, class. So oh, Wonderful. And what's good about the classes is they bring in a whole different group of seniors. They're not necessarily the same seniors that came in for lunch. They're a whole different group that are coming in to participate in that service of, of exercise or health, health and wellness classes. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So it... it is an outreach beyond maybe the regulars that come for lunch. Yes. Now you have other seniors taking advantage, and that's like what senior centers for. Right. We're we're rotating different groups, so the people that come for lunch may not be the ones that are participating in our activities. So we have a different group that comes in usually, and um, participates in some of our activities. And those uh, physical activity courses, like the 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 Zumba and the uh, yoga and those types of things. Are those advertised within the senior center itself or are those in our park and recreation magazine or they go out on social media? How would well, the word get out on those? Actually, all of the, the ways that you just listed. And plus, a lot of times the instructors are instructors in other places within the community, whether it may be at the gym or other areas. So they also bring the word of mouth uh, to the communities as well. Okay, one other question. Uh, when people make a donation for meals, so that's a voluntary donation for meals, does that go to FSA? Does it go to the town? How does it goes that to FSA. To help offset the cost of the, right. the food? It's directly handled through FSA. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the activities. Can I make one quick comment sure. or question? Um, you asked about pe how people get there. Um, do many people come from Demosa Village? And walk Not down. as many as I would like to see come from Demosa, but we, we do have a few. And I do coordinate with them over there, make sure they have all the calendars uh, so they know what our activities and, and things are happening over there. But we'd like to see more of Demosa uh, residents participate. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just want to say how exciting it was to be there. I've been on a couple occasions and participated in your balance class with my uh, mother-in-law and uh, we really enjoyed our time there. You both are great hosts and made us feel very comfortable. It was our first time there in uh, early November, I think. And um, it just, it was a wonderful experience and your enthusiasm and your dedication and knowledge of the how to make the environment welcoming and filled with activities is, is very notable. Um, not everybody can do what you're doing. We appreciate your talents greatly. Um, I see that you're going to outgrow that facility pretty quickly. And you, you had talked to me a little bit about uh, there's an outdoor area off of where we were having the first balance class that we outgrew we the outgrew. space. Exactly. Um, there was some talk of you know, how you could possibly enclose the outdoor patio area or something and make it larger. But um, we should look into that and at least explore the idea of what can be done to make a bigger exercise area as well. And that could be like a multi-use thing. Right now the room is, you're familiar with the room, it's a multi-use room. So I've kind of sectioned it off where we have lunch in one area and the other side of the room we use for exercise, but we're slowly growing out of the exercise area. We can see that, yeah. And as it becomes more and more popular, your capacity at 138 may have to find a way to be bigger too, huh? So we need to, we need to think about this and that might be a future 
thing that we need to look into. But it's very uh, much enjoyed by the community and uh, serves a very good purpose for our seniors. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Zahara, did, you're standing there. Would you like to uh, join in? Do you have your any comments? Your anniversary. You can sing and dance. Your one-year anniversary. <laughs> one-year anniversary. Thank What's you. your favorite thing about working at the senior center? The people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so much a people person, and interacting with them gives me a lot of joy. Very good. Well, thank well, that's, my, that's my purpose. Uh, if I can make one person smile, at the end of the day, my job is done. <laughs> well, you make a lot of people smile. We know that. You do. Okay. So, so thank you. Thank very you, good thank report. You. Thank you very much. And we welcome any of you to please come over and join us or come have coffee with the seniors. They do appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. The party thank is you. the 14th, you said? Uh, Christmas the party? Christmas party is the 14th, yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Item number 20, capital projects update. We have a staff report, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council, as we're okay. pulling up the PowerPoint presentation. The recommendation to you this evening is the Council receives and files the report. I'm just going to walk through these very briefly. Little League Drive, Sage to Palm, uh, the Council recently awarded that construction contract. Um, this is construction of curb gutter and sidewalk on the south side of Little League Drive. Um, with a cul-de-sac on the west end of the project. Um, construction is scheduled to begin on January 3rd of 2023, and it's an approximate 90-day construction project or a 90-day construction window. So that project will be wrapped up early next year. Very nice. Onaga Trail Pedestrian Improvement Project, that's Onaga between approximately Sage to Acoma. There are uh, proposed improvements include curb gutter and sidewalks on both the north and south sides. Uh, within those limits, the, the town council recently awarded that construction contract and construction is scheduled to begin on December 12th with a 90 to 120 day uh, construction window for that project as well. Uh, Aquatics and Recreation Center of the Council recently saw a full presentation uh, on that project. We are expecting to receive the 100% plans for plan check this week. And in the abbreviated version of the schedule, we hope to be out for construction bidding between January and March of 2023 for that project. Again, that's the indoor uh, aquatics facility and gymnasium project. Town Hall Modernization and Town uh, Council Chamber, that's the modernization of the former library space, which is adjacent to Town Hall. Um, also includes renovation or modernization of the Town Hall space and construction of a council chamber, a permanent chamber that would allow for council meetings, planning commission, parks recreation, cultural commission, uh, and any other committee or commission uh, that the town establishes. We're in the process of finishing the design development phase. We anticipate that's to be wrapped up in March or April of 2023. That will then come before the council for review of the scope of the project, the cost estimate, and looking at possible construction schedules for those improvements. Uh, you were just talking about the senior center and as the th council's third priority on public buildings, um, the first phase of this project would be some architectural enhancements to the primary entrance points of this facility, restroom expansion, and modernization of the lobby and office areas. Um, architectural plan preparation and staff review is anticipated to be taking place from January through April or May of 2023 with town council review in the summer of 23 following um, the preparation of those conceptual plans. Um, you heard discussion tonight about possible expansion of different uses in different areas. Um, the, one of the bigger problems in that facility I think the council is aware of is the restrooms. Um, they are not ADA compliant, they are old, uh, tattered and torn. 
um, in order to make them ADA compliant actually requires expansion. They can't be made compliant within the space that they have. It may be that there's going to be a need to be an addition to accommodate new restrooms. Um, how that's all going to fall in place, the architect will begin working on that with town staff right after the first of the year. Old Town Public Square, uh, in the upper left-hand corner was the original concept that the council saw with the public square adjacent to Highway 62, parking back by Yucca Trail and some, some open space and park space. Um, staff started working on a phased approach of parking lots back by Yucca Trail. We've revisited that issue and the landscape architect is revising plans to come back with parking a little bit closer to Highway 62. There would be some form of courtyard separating Highway 62 from the public parking. We hope to be back in front of the council with those revised plans in the spring of 23. SR 62 enhancements and beautification. This is probably one of the more difficult projects to implement. And why do I say that? Number one, we're working in Caltrans right of way, um, which is highly restrictive in what they allow us to do, uh, number one. Number two, the amount of right of way that we have to work with is extremely limited typically 10 feet or less outside of the traveled roadway. We are looking at nodes, and I think the council can visualize the intersection of Sage and Highway 62. There's some large outer highway areas um, that are already curbed off that would make an opportunity for landscaping enhancements, potentially some public art. So there's some locations along Highway 62 where maybe we can start making spot improvements. The council's also talked about entryway signs um, that's probably going to require property acquisition at both the east and west ends of Highway 62 on those two entrances. The town doesn't have any substantial property at either of those locations, so that's an item that we'll have to come back to the council for discussion. And then the town owns property along Highway 247, um, so you've got, I think, pretty easy opportunity for signage there. But for Highway 62, it's going to be difficult. Um, we anticipate being in front of the council with some of those alternatives in the spring of 23. What do we have coming down the pipeline for the council to look at? Um, in the very near future, you're going to see the annual crack seal program proposal, the cape and slurry seal, which follows that. Uh, staff is also in disc internal discussions on the possibility of uh, a million dollar, approximate million dollar overlay program for phase two and three of the wastewater collection facility project. I think the council will recall that uh, as the town puts together its road, has put together its road programs over the last five, six, seven, eight years, we've continued to say we have to monitor the progress of the wastewater collection system project and adjust our street work accordingly. And I think as the council is aware, phases two and phase, phase two and phase three have not moved forward. As a result, uh, we've got some roads that need some attention. So the staff is gonna be making a presentation to the council probably right after the first of the year on the potential for some in-house overlay work to occur within those phase two and phase three sewer areas. Uh, Council will be seeing Tri-Valley Little League master planning process as well as some phased improvements. You saw on your agenda tonight another annual allocation of CDBG funds to the Tri-Valley Little League facility. So we'll be coming forward with the planning process for that project. And then finally in 23, you're going to see an RFP and an award, a recommendation for award of professional services for project management for the widening of Highway 62 from four travel lanes to six travel lanes between Sage and Airway. Um, that's a very large project, uh, overhead utility, high power voltage lines, relocation, property acquisition, impacts to commercial driveways, um, impact to the traffic flow on Highway 62. It's a relatively complex project, long-term project, and we'll be bringing on, uh, bringing on board a firm that will manage all the components of that project. Recommendation again this, this evening is that the council receives a, and files a report and we'd be happy to answer any questions following public comment. Okay, thank you. Is there any member of the public that wants to comment on this? Seeing none, anyone online? Seeing none, uh, bring it back to the council for comment, questions. 
Nothing. Nothing. No, we, Member Lombardo. We've gone through this before, and I, I think that we're on the right track with the uh, the expenditures and the capital improvements, and I'd be happy to move it forward. Receive um, and file, right? Right, it's receive and file. Um, did I hear right that this uh, uh, Little League pedestrian improvement project, it does include the cul-de-sac at this time? That, Okay, so that'll be that'll be coming up in early 2023 then. Yes, sir, that's correct. Sounds like early in spring of 2023 is going to be pretty busy. It, it's yeah, the next the next six months is a very busy busy time, and then right about at the end of that six month period or a hair before that is when the Prop 68 project goes under construction. Wow. So next year is a very, very, very busy year. Sounds like sounds like we'll be moving a lot of stuff along. Um, a lot of stuff. Uh, do we? I think I heard that we were looking at uh, hiring a project manager. Is that in the works? Is that something that we're? I'm sorry, I look in the wrong way. <laughs> Gentlemen, yes, we are currently um, recruiting for a project manager. We are going to be scheduling interviews shortly within okay, the week. Good. So, well, that yeah. sounds like it's going to be a pretty necessary component. To Definitely all needed, along. yes. Okay. Uh, Council Member Abel? Yeah, um, on, uh, on the um, overlay work proposal um, for the sewer sections two and three, how aggressive are we looking at as far as doing an overlay project? Because as you know, and we know, and residents know, there's deferred maintenance on a lot of those. We didn't want to be that organization that put in brand new roads and then have the sewer tear them up a year or two later, a waste of taxpayer dollars. But obviously, as you know, it's getting to a point where we need to do something. How aggressive are we going to be in that overlay proposal? So I think what we what we have known for several years is that several of the roads in phase two, phase three are are band-aided together. And and we we're keeping our fingers crossed as to how long those roads would last in a reasonable condition for the wastewater project to move forward. So the uh, estimate that staff has prepared at this point in the listing uh, that we'll be presenting to the council for that million dollars is somewhere between a total of five and six miles of paved roadway. So it's pretty substantial, um, but, but the needs are substantial as well. So we'll be able to paint that picture for the council. Hopefully we will have some upda updated information from High Desert Water District on what their schedule is looking like so that the council can make a good policy decision on the expenditure of those funds. And, and doubling that amount of roads is, is something that we would have to decide where those monies came from if we tried to uh, 10 two, to 12 miles two, of two, thing, two things. Um, so yes, the council, if you wanted to double that amount of work, number one, staff would, would want to do some more field evaluation and road condition evaluation to assist in that effort. Number one, number two, of course, the standard financial um, process that the council goes through in their decision making. And it's probably, that level of work is probably not something that could be completed in one year. That would probably be a two year effort by, by your street crew. So a million dollars per year, two million dollars in one year, I don't believe is, is feasible with the crew that we have. So that'd probably be spread over two years. An overlay would be done by our street crew normally? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Really? Yes, we have we have the equipment. Now we haven't done some for a couple years. Yeah. Um, but no, the the crew is very well versed at the overlay program and and implementing those. It also is going to give us an opportunity to do some training. We have two new uh, employees on the street crew, and we have one individual that's going, or at least is planning on retirement here in the near future. So the opportunity for training is substantial. Uh, in 2023, so we're looking forward to that being part of the mix as well. And it, and it may be in your staff report coming up, but I, I noticed that the, we have traffic counts counters out again 
in some areas and so forth that's just an annual evaluation of speeds and traffic counts so yeah the town performs annual an annual traffic census sensing corporation around 65 different locations in town we monitor the change in traffic patterns on an annual basis that helps us coordinate street improvements uh, evaluating traffic safety issues accident reports all of those things are linked together in a comprehensive uh, traffic safety management program and sometime in the future if we wanted to do traffic counts or or look at uh, speeds and so forth let's say on a couple of arterial dirt roads and so forth that's something we could that, that same type of technology could be used or does it have to be a hard road surface Typically, it needs to be on a hard road surface, so those counters would be put out um, where you have the interface of the end of the asphalt with, with the dirt road. We also do manual counts where you actually have a human being sitting in a vehicle and actually doing traffic and pedestrian counts um, for a certain length of time, and can, that could occur over several days during the week. So there's alternative ways of approaching those numbers. Thank you. But you're welcome. Okay, well, it's going to be an exciting six months ahead of us. Um, so uh, that's a receive and file. Okay, so no action needed on that one. We'll move along to future agenda items. Any council members have any future agenda items? Seeing, like we're seeing none, we'll move along to public comments. The town council takes this time to consider your comments on items of concern which are not on the printed agenda. When you are called to speak, please state your name and community of residence. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Appropriate, inappropriate behavior which disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the meeting will result in for forfeiture of your public comment privileges. The town council is prohibited by state law from taking action on or discussing items not on the printed agenda. Is there any member of the public that would like to uh, make a comment this evening. Online. Seeing none, online, anybody online? Okay, thank you. We'll move along to staff reports and comments. Captain, do you have anything for us this evening? Uh, the only thing I'd like to pass along is this Friday at Starbucks here in Yucca Valley, we're gonna be hosting, well, Starbucks is gonna be hosting us with a, for a copy with a cough coffee with a cop event uh, it goes from eight in the morning till 10 in the morning so two hours starbucks is actually going to provide complimentary regular coffee uh and the last couple of times we've done this they provided some danishes as well and then of course their specialty drinks are available for purchase but really a good opportunity to get out with members of the community let them uh ask questions and meet our deputy sheriffs so i'll be there as well and i just encourage any member of the public who wants to come out and have a cup of coffee with us and say good morning. We'll be out there this Friday, 8 to 10, at the Starbucks here in Yucca Valley. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that outreach. Uh, I know that you folks had the open house. How did that go? Uh, the attendance wasn't what we had hoped, but it's the, the first one that we've done here, so we'll do it again in the future. Probably try and do a better job advertising, especially amongst uh, families with school-aged children. Um, but any steps that we can take to let the community know that that's that's their police station up there um, we'll, we'll try again yeah we had the opportunity also with the county supervisor and city of 29 palms town of yucca valley had a working lunch with the sheriff's department last week uh, just a chance to get together with the deputies and the other personnel there uh, to say thank you uh, as well as just talk about uh, different items of interest uh, to the collective communities and the un uh, unincorporated county area so thank you for that opportunity as well captain appreciate it sue or deborah you have anything this evening we had a great turnout at our holiday celebration yeah. snow santa Good shopping <laughs> it was fun everything it was great and the hot uh, chocolate was good the hot chocolate was good yes exactly so a great turnout for our holiday holiday so celebration um wrapping up this weekend with tomorrow's christmas wish they're doing their drive-through um distribution as they have done for the last two years and then also as nina mentioned we're having a senior dance dinner dance this weekend as well and that will pretty much wrap up uh, the holiday celebrations very nice Thanks, Sue. Good Tom, question. Okay. All right. Um, as Sue indicated, uh, we've finished most of our holiday activities, so we have one more council meeting on the 20th. You'll be doing your council reorganization. 
Uh, Mayor Schooler will be passing the gavel, presumably. Um, one never knows, but uh, maybe he will, maybe he won't. We'll see how that all plays out. And then uh, Council Member Dennison will be back uh, from his travels for the meeting of the 20th. So that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Curtis, one quick question. What was the budget on the snow day, roughly? Ooh, all in, I would probably somewhere around 20,000, but that it would include uh, both the vendor as well as staffing and some of the other um, uh, costs that go into that activity. It seemed, it was. But it's one of our most uh, popular activities across by the far. Year. It was yeah. well attended and the yeah. kids and the family seemed to be very receptive to the idea of what we were trying to do and they really enjoyed it. I was there wandering around asking people, what do you think of this? Is it something we should continue in by far the resounding yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> it was really, really nice. And the staff did a great job. Very uh, high level of energy, uh, very attentive to the, the community uh, uh, members and uh, just great attitudes among all of them that were working. Yeah, well, thank you for coming out and checking it out. Um, I, I think just from my observation, Sue may have other thoughts or other uh, counting metrics, but it seemed to be uh, one of our most uh, well-attended uh, Christmas events, holiday events in a while. Uh, and then it gives us an opportunity also, one of the, the beauties of it is to have kind of multiple things going on in one location. So it's staff yeah. efficiency. We're able to leverage the different resources that we bring to the table, yeah. something for the kids, something for the adults. It, it drives traffic to this community center for the craft fair, so the vendors like it. Uh, all around, looks, yeah. it looks to be a good, uh, good event. I heard nice things about the Christmas tree lighting as well. I wasn't able to make that, but... Sound like the the community really enjoyed it. There were a lot of comments about the kids and uh, said, yeah, that was kind of fun too. So pass that on. Okay, we'll get into mayor and council reports and comments. Council member Abel. Uh, none tonight. Thank you for all that attended and uh, thank you for the updates on all the wonderful projects coming forward. Council member Droves. I'd like to say uh, it's been a lot. There's been a lot of fun things this week, this last two weeks. Um, the Christmas tree lighting was incredible. A lot of people there. Um, Santa and Jack Frost, yeah, which really did a he did a great job. Also greeting everybody, and um, and then the same thing with Snow Play Day and the craft fair. Santa was there. The same Santa. The same Jack Frost. And they did a great job, and, and the kids were just playing in the snow and throwing snow, and, and the staff was really careful with the little kids going down the hill, and it was, it was fun. I have, some, I have some great videos. And, um, and then after that, the Rotary had the light parade, and there were a lot of people at the light parade. That was a really well attended, the Christmas light parade going down Santa Fe Trail, and that was fun. So there were a lot of fun events this week. So anyway... Um, it's really wonderful, especially the snow play day and the craft fair. That was wonderful. Thank you. Councilmember Lombardo. Um, I want to say welcome to our new employee, and I couldn't hear her name. I'm sorry. Celeste. I'm sorry? Celeste. Celeste. Okay. I had something that was close, but not Celeste. So welcome to Celeste. Huh. Happy, happy to have you as part of the family. I'm sure that uh, we're going to enjoy uh, your enthusiasm and your energies in the museum and uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, I want to thank the family of uh, Barry Absisek for uh, their attendance and for the do donation to the youth recreation in Barry's name. Uh, I think that's a very meaningful memorial and thank you for that. Um, thanks to the staff for all the things you got going man this place is hopping. Um, we've got a lot to be proud of here. Everybody's working together as a team and a family and getting a lot accomplished. Uh, looks like it's going to be a busy, busy uh, community for the next many months into the future with all the projects we got coming online and finishing up and starting up. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Everybody have a great Christmas. We'll be back together once before that, but, uh, a lot of people may be traveling for the holidays and that sort of thing. So uh, look forward to seeing you at the next thing then. Thank you. 
Okay, and I'll, uh, I just gonna have to add my, my compliments to uh, staff for making the uh, community events happening happen over the weekend and, and last week, the Christmas tree lighting, the craft fair, it, the snow play day, I could not, it was, you were bumping into people. There were so many people around here, inside and outside. You were just running into people. It was, it was uh, really well attended and it did feel just like, you know, a, a good sense of community. And the, and the Christmas tree lighting too, that just feels like uh, the hometown feel that we get yeah. here in Yucca Valley. So appreciate the effort on that. Um, Thank you for the Senior Center update. Welcome to Celeste. I didn't catch her name either, so I'm glad you asked for that. Um, it's hard to, hard to hear through the mask. Um, uh, Regional Housing Trust sounds like a, a pretty exciting option. I'm anxious to see what, what becomes of that as we move forward on that. And I did attend the, the Sheriff's Open House. I might have been one of the few, but it was, uh, it was I thought, awesome. I got a lot of personal attention on that one, and it was... Uh, <laughs> It was uh, a really a joy to see the captain's office over there. I don't know if you've ever been to a L.A. Dodger museum, but uh, that would be <laughs> that, that would be pretty similar to uh, what you see at the captain's office over there. So um, anyway, um, that's that's about it for this evening. Um, thank you for the senior center update. Great work over there, everybody. Uh, announcements. Upcoming meeting scheduled, the next regular meeting of the Yucca Valley Town Council will be held on Tuesday, December 20th, 2022 at 6 p.m. in the Yucca Valley Community Center Yucca Room. And with that, we will adjourn this meeting.